And I'd like to take us back to a happy time long before our respective nations were bickering over our divorce settlement and to consider the evidence for links between the Netherlands and Britain during the Calcolithic and Early Bronze Age periods. This is admittedly a well-worn path, but there are many loose ends that need to be tied up, and there has been a very significant recent development that's making us all revisit our narratives. Let me uh, start by posing a stark question, if I get this. Oh. Okay. Did Dutch <laughs> hordes kill off the early Britons who started Stonehenge, as we were led to believe when we opened our copy of the Observer newspaper back in May? This question was prompted by the results of a major international DNA study by David Reich and Inigo Olalde of Harvard Medical School, which obtained genome-wide data on a large number of beaker-associated individuals from different parts of Europe, including 19-plus from Britain. Importantly, they also analysed numerous skeletons of people who pre- and post-dated the beaker users, and they compared the evidence with information on recent Europeans. The results have generated a huge amount of interest and debate. They showed that Iberian beaker users were basically descended from the indigenous Neolithic inhabitants there and were genetically very different <coughs> from the beaker users in East, Central and Northern Europe who have a strong steppe ancestry resulting from previous Yamnaya or even pre-Yamnaya migration. Of greatest interest to this morning session, though, is the finding that British beaker users showed a very, very strong genetic contrast with the Neolithic inhabitants of Britain. You can see it here in the Y chromosome data for males. This proves beyond doubt that the earliest beaker users in Britain must have been immigrants. Furthermore, when they compared the genetic makeup of the British beaker users with that of continental beaker users, they found a particularly strong similarity with a group from Ostwald in the northern Netherlands. You can see it in the pie chart here. Although there were also hints that some had come from further down the Rhine, which tallies with the archaeological and isotope evidence for our famous Amesbury archer. The other major finding, looking back at the bar chart, is that while there was certainly some interbreeding with indigenous Brits, <laughs> by around 2000 BC, people's genetic makeup shows 93% of continental, ultimately steppe ancestry, suggesting a genetic predominance of the continental bloodlines. And this steppe ancestry signature continues to be the dominant genetic signature to this day. Now this, of course, has reignited the century-long debate about whether we're dealing with an immigrant beaker folk, and not surprisingly, there has been robust discussion about the interpretation favoured by the geneticists, which is one of a massive migration of beaker users into Britain, followed by a near total population turnover of some kind. The implication is a virtual wipeout. At stake in this debate are issues of scale, causality and effect, not to mention correctness. The genetic results show us that it's now undeniable that there was some immigration and indeed the early beaker styles in use in Britain and uh, the funerary conventions and the instances of imported continental objects broadly lend support to Stuart Needham's idea model for a multi-directional influx dominated by movement from the Rhine Delta but including some movement from further down the Rhine and also probably an Atlantic northern French stream to parts of Western Britain and Ireland although there aren't enough DNA and that analyzed samples from France to, con to confirm this genetically yet. And I think we can now revisit the evidence from Scotland and say that the new genetic data lend support to my argument that some early beaker users there probably came from the Netherlands, as we can see here in Newmill in central Scotland and here in Kilmartin Glen. Okay. Next slide. And here, in Kilmartin Glen, on the west of Scotland. My friend Harry Falkins has pre previously taken issue with me over points of detail. He was saying, for example, that the chamber here is twice as big as the ones in the Netherlands. But hey, sea change, folks. And had offered the alternative argument that Scottish people had gone over to the continent and adopted the novel material culture and practices. But since there's no evidence for regular travel from Britain to the continent in the centuries before, just before 2500 BC, then, given the new genetic data, it seems much more likely that these are indeed graves of Dutch immigrants. And while no trace of the actual body survived in these two graves, 
at Sorisdale on the Hebridean island of Col. Um, we have what must be the grave of a first-generation immigrant, to judge from both genetic and isotopic data. Clearly then, like the Amesbury Archer, some people were travelling long distances. We know from Sorisdale that it wasn't just men who were moving, but women too. This was a young woman. And since people don't bury themselves, we're now dealing with, uh, not dealing with isolated individual immigrants, but with groups of immigrants. But how many came over and why? And unfortunately, genetics can't help us here, since, as David Reich admitted when I pressed him on the subject, it is not possible to say whether we are dealing with 50, 500 or 5,000 promiscuous Dutch Casanovas, yes, you guys, who came over and impregnated our women folk. It would therefore be very premature to talk of a massive migration. And what about the near total genetic turnover as posited by the geneticists? Did the indigenous Neolithic people just disappear or die off? Did these pesky Dutch hordes kill them, even though they had, by then, managed to finish building Stonehenge on time and in budget? <laughs> the answer can only be no, since we know that some indigenous practices, such as the building of massive monuments like Silbury Hill, continued after Beaker people appeared, and also some Beakers were deployed in a distinctly local indigenous manner. We have to bear in mind that the sample of analysed specimens only constitutes a tiny and quite possibly unrepresentative proportion of all the people who lived in Britain during the Calcolithic. It may be that the indigenous late Neolithic practice of cremation persisted, with the remains being scattered and thus archaeologically invisible. Or else it could be that these sexy new immigrants with their funny foreign ways proved to be irresistible to the locals who welcomed them and interbred vigorously and preferentially. I think that for now, even though the genome data gives some hints as to the overall and marked genetic change in Britain, we need to analyse many more individuals before we can hazard a reliable hypothesis. As for why people came over, the usual range of explanations seems plausible. That is, some were probably metal prospectors, as we know from the Ross Island copper mine in southwest Ireland, and as Peter Bray has suggested regarding the exploitation of copper in Cornwall in southwest England. Some, like the Amesbury Archer, were probably high-ranking men, making their heroic, Odysseus-like journeys to foreign lands, perhaps drawn by the fame of the solstice celebrations in and around Stonehenge. Others may simply have sought to make a new life elsewhere. But despite decades of discussion on this topic, there's still much to be understood about the social dynamics in the Netherlands and elsewhere around the 25th century BC that led some people to relocate to Britain. This influx of beaker-using immigrants wasn't the end of cross-channel contact with the Netherlands, of course, and of particular interest is the evidence suggesting continued or renewing con renewed contacts in the succeeding centuries. Intriguingly, this pot beaker found in Northern Ireland may indicate continuing arrival of people from the Netherlands, as it wouldn't necessarily have been among the earliest types of beaker to be introduced to Britain and Ireland. And this hoard from Mickdale in North East Scotland, dating to around 2000 BC, suggests an awareness of fashions, albeit female fashions, in distant Bavaria down the Rhine. Could there have been dis long distance to and, and fro -ing? I should add here, by the way, that there is funding available at Edinburgh University for a master's next year for someone wishing to undertake a critical comparative study of Dutch and North British beakers. Meanwhile, further south in England, and especially in East Anglia and the Thames Estuary, barbed wire beakers offer unmistakable evidence for cross-channel connections with the Netherlands between around 2000 and 1800 BC. And yet there has been precious little said about the nature of this connection, beyond David Clark way back in 1970, seeing it as another wave of immigrants. If it wasn't another influx of new people, and heaven knows we do not want to go back to the bad old culture historical days when every novelty was interpreted in terms of invasions, then it's hard to understand this connection specifically in terms of exchange networks associated with the flow of metal, since East Anglia was not, as far as we know, a key hub in the flow of metal. Or was it? Once again, this is a topic that would benefit from closer attention. But as far as developments elsewhere in Britain from 2000 BC onwards are concerned, it certainly does seem that a, likely that a major driver of cross-channel links was the flow of metals, and in particular tin, from southwest England. 
I've argued elsewhere that the know-how to make faience by combining these rather unpromising looking ingredients is most likely to have been acquired in Britain through long distance contacts with metal workers in Central Europe who seem to have been imported English tin, importing English tin from as early as 2000 BC. Over 50 years ago, Stuart Piggott argued that the wealth of the graves in the area around Stonehenge in central Wessex, such as here at Bushbarrow, was due to the elite in that area having established control over the flow of southwest English tin to the continent and to other parts of Britain and Ireland. While Stuart Needham has, has debated this and has emphasised the importance of other sources of power, including control over the ceremonial activities at Stonehenge, nevertheless, it seems hard to deny that monopolising the metal flow was probably a major factor in the power base of this well-connected elite, especially given the rarity of rich contemporary graves in the tin-producing areas of the southwest. In other words, the folks who were producing the tin weren't benefiting <coughs> from it. The way that the inland Wessex elite chose to express their cosmopolitan sophistication was by emphasising their links with their counterparts in Brittany. And it's also possible to interpret the changing pattern of elite geography that we see with the development of Needham's Channel Maritory sometime in the 18th century in terms of a shifting pattern of control over the flow of tin and possibly other metal. Now it was the elite living closer to the coast, not just in Wessex, but all along the channel on both sides, who were becoming rich and powerful, sharing a vocabulary of esteem, a set of drinking equipment and social conventions across and along the channel. It's like a vision of an EU common trade area. And if we were in any doubt about the importance of tin at this time, the recent discovery of a set of jewellery from a waterlogged kist on Dartmoor reminds us that this precious material featured prominently in the elite display at the time. And we know that tin was deliberately added to the faience beads made in Britain at that time. While tin may well have improved the shininess of the glaze, it was mostly there as a statement of wealth. It was the conspicuous consumption of a valuable resource and probably a boost to the magical amuletic powers attributed to faience. And it's during this period that the composite necklace found at Exlo and the handful of other faience beads found in the Netherlands made their way across the channel from southern England. As argued in my Paleo Historia article way back in 2006, most of the components in this necklace had probably originated in southern England, including the beads, single star here, reused from an old amber spacer plate necklace with the double stars of are, are, uh, Netherlands uh, amber that was added in the Netherlands. Also from southern England came the faience beads, the tin beads, and arguably also the sheet, sheet bronze tubular bead here. And uh, <clears throat> this is un an undeniable material expression of the close links between our countries around 1750 BC. And as Lisbeth Tynison has explored other, other aspects of these links here, including the use of cinerary urn types that are shared across the channel in Wessex. We are not talking about groups of immigrants here, but rather with communities that interacted as equals and who chose to materialize their links in the artifacts that expressed their identities and their affiliations so clearly. Others have explored subsequent cross-channel contacts in excellent publications such as this, and we shall be hearing about these later in this session. But I just really want to end by saying that trading with our continental chums and friendly interaction as equals has a very long pedigree, and our current politicians mess with this at our peril. Cheers!